Welcome to the Society for American Soccer History's first Friday SAS session of 2021. Founded in 1993, SASH works to promote, facilitate, and disseminate research into the rich history and heritage of soccer in the United States. You can best find us in two places, on the web at ussoccerhistory.org and on social media with Facebook and Twitter accounts. Thank you to all our members for your continued interest and support. A brief word about renewals. About half of our memberships expired with the turn of the new year and have yet to be renewed. So please renew. And if you're thinking of joining, you can do that. Please do. Uh, all are welcome. And you can do that through our website. The Society also welcomes some new members to the executive board this year, including David Kilpatrick, George Kiosis, and Patrick Sullivan. During our executive uh, board meeting last month, we brainstormed and planned for the first series of SASH sessions, uh, including today's. Our next session will be in March, and it'll be a panel on the Irish influence on American soccer. We've also planned uh, programs for April and May, but are open to new ideas, new research, new programs, uh, and we hope some of that can come from you all. So please reach out. Uh, with ideas or things you'd like uh, to see. Last year, around this time, I wrote an article for the Society website on Leonard Rainey, the first African-American to ever play varsity soccer at Kearney High School in New Jersey. He was part of the 1922 squad. I began that article with the following. Doing American soccer history can be hard, but doing African-American soccer history is harder still. Too often there is an uncooperative historical record, so historians have to look long and hard to unearth even the tiniest of leads. Importantly, the number of African-American soccer stories has increased recently, notably with the string of Black History Month posts at the Stars and Stripes site by Donald Wine II and the recent scholarship of historian Dr. Jermaine Scott who writes on the African-American soccer experience. Two of our members have added to that scholarship, having recently unearthed two important actors in the American soccer story, brothers from Pawtucket, Rhode Island, who are the earliest known African-American soccer players in the United States. So please allow me to introduce today's presenters before I turn it over to them. First, Ed Farnsworth. The focus of Ed Farnsworth's research is Philadelphia soccer history and early U.S. soccer history. Former managing editor of the Philadelphia Soccer Page, his work has also appeared on the SASH the Encyclopedia of Greater Philadelphia, the Inquirer.com, the Cup.us, and in the 2011 MLS All-Star Program. He's a contributor to the forthcoming book from the University of Tennessee, Soccer Frontiers, the Global Game in the United States with a chapter on Philadelphia. Brian Bunk teaches in the history department at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. His book, From Football to Soccer, The Early History of the Beautiful Game in the United States, will be published by the University of Illinois Press in July 2021. So I'll turn it over to Ed and Brian now. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Brian and I are grateful uh, for you taking the time to join our presentation on Oliver and Fred Watson, two brothers born in Rhode Island, who were the earliest identified African-American soccer players in the United States. We've located reports on the brothers in Pawtucket and Fall River newspapers beginning in 1894 through to 1907. Between them, the Watson brothers achieved several US soccer history milestones, including the first African-American player in a senior league match, the first to play and score in a national championship tournament, the first to win a senior league championship, and the first to play for a professional team. Uh, for today, I'll give an overview of the brothers' playing careers, and then Brian will discuss further biographical information on the brothers and their family before providing some context and view of other examples of African-American representation in early U.S. soccer history. I'll begin with a quick background on the Pawtucket Fall River soccer scene at the start of the Watsons' playing careers.
Uh, Pawtucket and Fall River had deep connections to the textile industry, which itself was connected to the orig origins of organized soccer on the east coast of the United States. The area's economy made it an attractive place at the end of the 19th century. Pawtucket's population grew from nearly 28,000 to almost 40,000 between 1890 and 1900. Fall River's population over the same period grew from around 74,000 to almost 105,000. Soccer teams began to be organized in the area by the mid 1880s. A major factor in the area's reputation as an early soccer center in the US was its success in the American Football Association's American Cup tournament, the winner of which was crowned the champion of the United States. Local teams first entered the 1887-88 edition of the tournament and quickly found success. Fall River sides won the championship every year from 1888 to 1892 before Pawtucket Free Wanderers won in 1893. Local players also bolstered the area's reputation in international matches, representing the AFA in international friendlies against Canada beginning in 1888. Reigning American Cup champions Fall River Rovers embarked on their own Canadian tour the next year. Several players on the all New England league side that visited Canada in 1891 joined the Canadian American team that toured the United Kingdom the same year. While the contributions of UK born players, coaches and administrators were important, soccer was quickly embraced by native born athletes in Fall River and Pawtucket, making the area an early producer of US born soccer talent. For example, the Brooklyn team in the short lived American League of Professional Football Clubs of 1894 was made up of players from the Fall River, from Fall River teams. Uh, birthplaces have been identified for 11 of the 14 players on the rosters. Seven were born in New England, two were French Canadian, and only two were born in the UK. Fan support for local teams was strong and attendance for high profile matches among the highest yet seen in North America. While crowds of 2000 were regularly reported, some 6,000 turned out for the AFA Cup semifinal on March 1892, and 10,000 reportedly were on hand to see an exhibition night game played under electric lights in June 1893 between the Free Wanderers and Toronto Varsity. Such attendance numbers made the area an attractive destination for visiting sides. It didn't hurt that the close proximity of Fall River and Pawtucket made it possible to arrange matches in both cities to increase the chance of turning a profit. Between 1887 and 1893, the area hosted no fewer than 19 exhibition matches against teams from as near as Boston to the north and as distant as Philadelphia to the south and Chicago and Toronto to the west. Beginning in 1890, the areas also began to host American Cup finals. That year, some 5,000 spectators turned out in Pawtucket to see Fall River Olympics defeat New Jersey's Kearney Rovers. All of this success in the American Cup, the development of native born players and strong fan support contributed to make Fall River and Pawtucket one of the early soccer centers in the US. But by the start of the 1894-95 season, the effects of the economic crisis that became known as the Panic of 1893 were being felt in the mills and factories that powered the local economy. The exodus of many leading players to the ALPF had also shaken the local New England League, which was made up of teams from Massachusetts and Rhode Island. The AFA's subsequent banning of these players from playing in the American Cup was another blow to the league as the season got underway and fan support suffered. The Pawtucket YMCA team was a new team, first joining the New England League for the 1893-94 season. Oliver Watson, age 22, signed with the team as a reserve forward in September 1894, getting his first start in, in an away league match against Fall River Olympics on December 22, 1894. Oliver was one of four YMCA players playing in place of regular starters, and while he scored in his debut, the young team lost in a blowout by the score of eight to two. While the match was described as quote, too one-sided to be interesting, one report noted something very interesting. Quote, Watson, a colored man, played on the wing for the visitors. He was the first colored player ever seen in this city 
and during the game, he caused no end of fun by his funny talk and antics. This was the first report of an African-American playing in a senior league match in the United States. The racially loaded description of quote, funny talk and antics was quickly replaced with praise and reports covering his next appearance, a Christmas day friendly that saw YMCA defeat the Free Wanderers 5-1. While he did not score in the win, Oliver was described as doing some quote, some good work both in dribbling and passing. Bad winter weather wreaked havoc on the match schedule that season, and Oliver next appeared in an American Cup second round match on March 9, 1895 against Fall River East Ends, scoring the equalizer when his side was down 3-2 before providing assist on two more goals and would finish as a 6-3 victory for YMCA. The Fall River Daily Globe, which had previously written of Oliver's quote, funny talk and antics, now referred to him as quote, the gentleman of color and praised his passing skills. It was the first time an African-American played in and scored in an American Cup match. YMCA then faced the Free Wanderers in the American Cup semifinals on April 20, 1895, with Oliver scoring the go-ahead goal to make it 2-1 in a match that ended in a 2-1, uh, excuse me, in a 2-2 draw. He played in the replay on March 4, or excuse me, on May 4, but did not score in the 4-2 loss. In Fall River on June 1, the Free Wanderers faced Carney Caledonians in the American Cup final, losing 4-1. It was the end of the era of Fall River and Pawtucket American Cup dominance. At the start of the 1895-96 season, another Watson was on the Pawtucket YMCA roster, Fred Watson, Oliver's 20-year-old younger brother. Fred had first appeared in newspaper, newspaper reports in April 1894, when during a reserve match, he accidentally broke the leg of an opponent in a collision. With two Watsons now on the YMCA lineup, first, initial, excuse me, first initials differentiating them began to regularly appear in match reports with Oliver identified most often by an A for Ollie. Should note his 1925 obituary lists his name as Oliver H.A. Watson. The Fall River Daily Globe noted the YMTA team was, quote, greatly strengthened by the addition of the Watson brothers. As the 1895-96 season got underway, the Fall River Daily Evening News commented, quote, the work of the two fast colored men recently added to the YMCA will be matched with interest, they being the first colored men to play the game in this country. While matched was clearly meant to be watched in the report, only an unknown typesetter long lost to history can answer whether county was meant to be country. Nevertheless, a Paul Tuckett Evening Times review of the YMCA team noted, quote, Fred Watson is improving every game he plays, while suggesting Oliver would be more effective with, quote, a little more life in his play. We don't know if Oliver read the Evening Times report, but he scored two goals in the next game telling the opening goal and then the go-ahead goal and a 6-2 win over Fall River East Ends on October 26. Both brothers appeared in the American Cup first round match against Fall, excuse me, against Free Wanderers on November 9, 1895, with Oliver scoring the equalizer in the 1-1 draw. Fred appeared in the replay on November, November 28, which YMCA lost 5-3, but Oliver did not. French Fred's defensive play in the match was praised for blocking, quote, many brilliant attempts at scoring. Soon after, the notorious New England winter weather once again disrupted the match schedule. In mid-December, the New England League suspended the season, canceling it for good in March 18, 1896. The league organized no matches for the 1896-97 season, and the YMCA team disbanded. Scattered reports show Fred playing with the Free Wanderers in 1898, but organized soccer in the area continued to struggle with the adverse effects of both the economic crisis and the severe winter weather, and the 1898-99 season was abandoned. Organized soccer in Pawtucket was now at a low point. Instead, polo, a kind of indoor hockey on roller skates, was capturing the sporting public's attention and drawing big crowds during the winter months. 
Oliver, now 27, and Fred, 24, appear together again for the first time in four years in November 1899 with the Attleboro team, which soon joined the newly formed Rhode Island Amateur League as the Attleboro and Dodgeville team. The ADs won the 1900-1901 league championship, each brother making 10 appearances during the championship season with Oliver scoring nine goals. This is the first time African-American players were on a senior league championship soccer team in the US and quite possibly in the English speaking world. Before the start of the 1901-02 season, the brothers were, were with the Thorntons said to be made up of the best players in Rhode Island. Press reports now clearly describe the Watsons as the only African-American soccer players in the US, calling them Cracker Jack or exceptionally good players. News coverage also emphasized Oliver and Fred were brothers, but the Thornton team disbanded before the start of the newly reorganized New England League season, following disputes revolving around the issue of professionalism and accusations of ill treatment by the league. Fred then signed with the now professional Pawtucket Free Wanderers. Reports say Fred's play with the Free Wanderers was greatly admired. He made seven appearances for the team in November and December 1901 before, in an eerie echo of the start of his playing career, his leg was broken in a collision with another player in a Christmas Day match against the Fall River Pan Americans. One report said Fred had, quote, played a plucky game before his injury. Another noted he was, quote, very popular with fans, adding, Quote, he was a strong kicker and played a clean sportsmanlike game. After his injury, regular reports on Fred's recovery appeared in local newspapers, underscoring his popularity in the Pawtucket and Fall River soccer communities. Meanwhile, a benefit match was organized on his behalf. 3,000 spectators turned out for the match on January 25, 1902 at the Dexter Street grounds in Pawtucket. One report laments that more money could have been raised for him if it had been possible to better control paid entry into the grounds. This created the impetus to form an association to fund the building of a new enclosed ground. After Fred's injury, injury it becomes difficult to confidently track his and Oliver's playing career. Reports in Pawtucket and Fall River newspapers through 1907 include mentions of Watson's playing in the positions typically occupied by the brothers, but few include a first or initial or other information necessary to positively identify these Watsons as Oliver or Fred. There's much we don't know about the Watsons. We don't know what they look like. We don't know how they came to play soccer or when they started to play. We don't know what other African-Americans in their community made of them playing soccer or if they attended matches to cheer them on. And we don't know what kind of abuse the Watsons surely endured from white players and fans. While the Watsons race was a recurring subject in newspapers report, more often it was not mentioned. No reports have been found to suggest efforts were made to bar them from playing with white players. Indeed, the available record suggests Oliver and Fred were ultimately judged by their ability on the field of play rather than by the color of their skin. And that stands out in the American sporting landscape of the day. While the Watson story was forgotten for more than 100 years, we now know through their achievements that African Americans were notable participants in some of the earliest history of soccer in the United States and one of the early centers of the game. And now I'll turn it over to Brian. Do you just want to do the slides still? And sure. You want me to do it? Sure. I'll just give a cool a heads up when I need a slide. How about that? Sounds good. So I'm, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the the uh, the biography of the family itself, and and a little bit more about Fred and Oliver, their life off the pitch. I mean, we don't know a, a tremendous amount, unfortunately, but I thought I'd just um, do a quick summary. Um, this is a a page from the 1900 census and you can see the family living there, uh, Charles and Lucy, uh, the parents, and then uh, four of their five sons are um, living on uh, Meadow Street in uh, Pawtucket. And 
here's a um, contemporary image of the house, which still stands. Uh, it's a small house, so having, what was it, six adults living in there must have been quite the close quarters, I guess. Um, but So here's just a, a rough family tree, uh, and I'll just say a little bit about each uh, person as much as we know. Uh, so Charles Watson, the father, was born in 1833 in Connecticut, and he moved to Rhode Island around 1853. We don't know when he married Lucy Kernis. Uh, she had been born in 1834 in Rhode Island. Uh, so presumably they met and married in, uh, in Rhode Island. Uh, the eldest son, Charles F. Watson, was born in 1864. And uh, Charles, uh, the son, and all of the other brothers were born in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Uh, Charles was an engineer for the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad. Uh, and he married Sarah around 1893, uh, and the couple had no children. So uh, you'll see as we go through the list that all of the brothers who married, none of them, well, even the brothers who weren't married, as far as we know, none of the Watson sons had any children. James C. Watson was born in 1867, worked as a crew member on a steamship, and as you can see there, died uh, fairly young and never married. Eugene, I guess we can go to the next slide. Eugene Alexander Watson was born in 1870. And um, apart from Fred and Oliver, and obviously our interest in their soccer careers, he probably was the most prominent uh, public figure uh, of the Watsons. Uh, he was born in 1870. And as you can see from his biography here, uh, he had an, a very interesting career. Uh, he was a postal clerk, the managing editor of the Providence Advance, a newspaper reporter, a member of many civic and fraternal organizations. Uh, he played the saxophone and organ, and at one point he was, uh, his profession was listed as a professional musician. He married uh, a woman named Eva at some unknown date, uh, and we just don't have a tremendous amount of information about her or really any of the women uh, in the Watson family, unfortunately. So Oliver, as we talked about, or Ed mentioned, was born in 1872. And he worked as a bolt maker with Standard Nut and Bolt Company for most of his life. Uh, and he was celebrated um, in his obituary uh, as, a, as a hard worker, as a, as a beloved a figure on the shop floor. Uh, and he, he never married. Fred was born in 1875. He worked at William Haskell Manufacturing Company in a variety of jobs, uh, including making bolts like his brother. He married Elsie Watts in 1901. She was born in New Bedford in 1881 and as an adult played in a string quartet and was a member of the Providence uh, Dog Kennel Club. She died in 1931. Uh, he, Fred remarried, if you go to the next slide, I guess. Fred remarried a woman named Dora a few years later, uh, but again, little is known about her and her background. They lived in a house Fred owned at 942 Roger Williams Avenue in Rumford, which is a section of East Providence, Rhode Island. In 1940, the house was valued at $4,000, which is about $75,000 today. And Fred uh, was still working 40 hours a week, 51 weeks a year at a steel mill. For his labors, he took home $1,650, which is about $31,000 a year. He died in 1941, but Dora continued to live in the house until she passed in 1968. Uh, and the house, it appears, was torn down within a few years of her death. So how do we think about the Watson brothers in the context of US soccer history? I mean, Ed listed all of the firsts and the earliest uh, accomplishments that they, that they did. Uh, as of now, they are the earliest documented African-American soccer players, yet in many ways they are outliers and they did not seem to usher in a dramatic growth in the number of black players in the US. Nevertheless, just as they were ending their careers, we begin to find evidence of more people of color playing the game. Often this was at schools in places like Brooklyn, Springfield, Massachusetts, Chicago, and of course, Soccer Town USA, Kearney. Over the next two decades, Afro-Caribbean immigrants from New York City were forming clubs and competing in leagues with white teams. Some of players of color competed in the American Soccer League during the 1920s and 30s, 
and later Gil Heron starred on teams in Detroit and Chicago. Hopefully more research will help fill in the gaps and begin to make black players even more visible in the history of soccer in the United States. So thank you. So just tremendous, open it just up tremendous. Questions. Yes, yes, let's open it up uh, for questions. And uh, I just wanna thank uh, Ed and Brian. There was a little bit of secrecy, you know, involved um, in their research. Um, and uh, my first question would, would be, you know, what was the Eureka moment? You know, was it a, a, a newspaper clipping? You know, then there was, you know, some talk uh, between, you know, Brian and Ed, Ed and Brian, and they embarked uh, on this project. So, you know, when did that Eureka moment happen? You know, and how long did it take you to, to then, you know, get us to today? Uh, I, I, I was doing research on another project and you know, going through a newspaper archive, looking at articles. And uh, funnily enough, it, it, it's a time period that I've you know, done other research on. And underneath a bunch of articles that I had clipped you know, in the past few years, I see this line, something about a colored player. And it's a Friday, I'm sneaking some research in at work. <laughs> and I was, I was like, I can't look at this now. I'm gonna come back to it on Monday and see if it actually said what I thought it said. So I came back on Monday and it did. And I had my Eureka moment and thought somebody must have seen this before, right? And I, so I got in touch with Brian, his region. And he'd also written several articles for the SASH website last year covering African-American soccer history and said, have you come across this before? And he said, no. So we both had a bit of a shout. And then very interestingly, our first research track didn't pan out, but is nevertheless fascinating. And I'll let Brian describe that. Sure, I mean, we then started to comb through the newspapers looking for any mention of, uh, of these players. And we, we had the last name and we had a first initial A and O. And so we were thinking about what that might be. And, and our first thought was a, uh, a boxer who was well known kind of in the Boston, New England, Philadelphia area who came from British Guyana named Andy Green or Andy Watson, sorry. Uh, and um, so we, we kind of followed that rabbit hole for a while because he, um, as I said, was born abroad. And so maybe that could explain um, that sort of racist um, language that the Fall River paper used if he had a, an accent or something like that. And as a sportsman, it also maybe kind of fit uh, that he might have played the, the game when he was a child at home and, and would have taken up the sport. But uh, pretty soon uh, we, we figured there were found some inconsistencies, uh, matches that we knew Watson or one Watson had participated in, but Andy Watson had a fight uh, somewhere very far away. <laughs> uh, and then finally, I decided to look through uh, the genealogy records and almost right away popped up these two brothers and the initials fit. And from that point on, you know, we, we felt comfortable that we had identified them. And, and then we slowly over many uh, days and weeks, um, texting back and forth, having Zoom conversations, um, many eureka moments, <laughs> finding out his nickname was Allie, was a big one that explained why sometimes he was listed as O. Watson and sometimes as A. Watson. So it was a cir circuitous pa uh, path, but we got there, I guess, in the end, I think. Oh, as well, though, you have to unmute yourself. Go ahead. Oh, yes. Sorry. Um, <laughs> this is a fascinating story. And even more fascinating are the description, 
the descriptions of how you put this together, which is obviously sounds very familiar to anybody working in that period. <laughs> um, I, I have a question, unfortunately, a bit on the margins, and it, it refers to the first slide that you had, and in which you mentioned these two teams from, or maybe the same team that changed name, I don't know, from Fall River, the Rovers and the Olympics. Mm -hmm. and I couldn't help uh, noticing that these are the, the were the names of the the first working class team that won the FA Cup in England from Blackburn, the Blackburn Olympics, oh. and and the Rovers three years later won the FA Cup again, and so I was just wondering, is this just uh, serendipitous? That first of all, are these two different teams from Fall River or the same one changing two different names? teams? Two they different. They are two different teams, yeah, and so. I mean, is the connection with with the Blackburn by chance, or I, it's a stupid question? But I mean, you can't, you know, it's it's uh, it's so obvious that there is sure. A no, I I, th I think Rovers was a, a common somewhat name. common yeah. name for for teams in the, in the day. I I don't know uh, of the origin of the the Fall River Rovers name. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some you know, old country connection going on there. Uh, and similarly for the, for, for the Olympics, um, I'm, I'm, I'm always interested how names that were somewhat popular, it seems for a time in, 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 in that time period, and then disappeared. Like I've come across lots of teams named non pariel And I, and I, I, I imagine it's just that that one just doesn't roll off the tongue very well and, and gets dropped. But, uh, but yeah, they, they were two different teams. Okay, thank you. And, and a, a lot of the folks from Fall River came from Lancashire, England, right? That, that district uh, where all the textiles were coming from. So mm -hmm. uh, they, they would have been in that environment if it wasn't necessarily Blackburn, it could have been Bolton, it, you know, it, yeah. Macclesfield, you know, all that, you know, migration was was coming um, westward. How's it going, everybody? If, uh, I don't know if somebody has another question. I haven't seen the video, but if not, huh? could I have one? <laughs> Go for um, it. Regarding, regarding the uh, teams, um, you're saying that he went from one team to another. Um, I've always been interested in uh, understanding a bit more of like the teams and the brands and rivalries. And if one player goes to a rivalry team within the same city, do you see that happening um, with with players within this time frame? Definitely, definitely, uh, uh, and sometimes surprising where you, you you see players that are very closely associated with one team suddenly switching to a rival, and uh, you know there are suggestions in the historical record that that. Uh, you know, money is involved and, and sort of professionalism, uh, you know, players getting signing fees and the like, but. Uh, that was always of the perspective, in my opinion, of, of a very talented player, because that means that two teams that are, you know, high category looking for the same player and willing to address that player to come sure. in shows the quality of player that they are. So I think that that speaks highly of the, of the Watson. Uh, well, with, with the Watsons, uh, they're, they're, I think that comes into play later in their career. They don't move away from the YMCA team until after it disbands. And but but you know, sadly, at the what's what's happening is that soccer itself is really struggling at that time. They just can't get games played because terrible weather is destroying fields, and you know people just can't play in it. Uh, but he does very quickly, it seems, get picked up by the Free Wanderers, which were their rivals. He is clearly recognized as, as a talent. And, and then later with the Thorntons, which was kind of a pick team, uh, again, their talent is, is recognized as, you know, as there's news, newspaper reports that describe it as, you know, picked among, from amongst the best players in the state. Uh, they, he, moved, he then signs with the pro, their team's by now pro, uh, free wanderers. And it, the record is a little uncertain as to whether or not Oliver was also with that team. After, after Fred's injury, there are a couple of matches where an Oliver is playing, or excuse me, where a Watson is playing the position that Oliver played in, but there's no first initial 
and there's not he's not called out as a brother or by his race in, in reports. So we're just not comfortable saying that's him, you know. But uh, but you're right. It is something that, as much as the historical record allows, the question of player movement, whether it's within a city and rival teams, let alone players moving between different cities, is very interesting and 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 one that hopefully we'll we'll learn more about. And given this early era, if I could just add, I would add that it was often considered in some places and some competitions to be a major problem when uh, a player would switch or flip from one team to another, especially during the middle of the season. And so I've seen uh, rules, league rules that expressly forbid that from happening. So it did seem to happen quite a bit. And then the leagues felt this was a problem and teams would often protest if a player had appeared on another team earlier in the same season and that kind of thing. So it did or could at least sometimes cause a great deal of consternation and strife among the clubs if they were seen as signing or poaching other players. And I'll add one thing, another word that early on I would see was reorganized. So-and-so club reorganized. And it was usually in that August, September you know, month. And I'm like, what did the club disband and then reorganize? Basically it was their silly season or their transfer window where they were looking to re-sign players um, from one year uh, to the next. So this is certainly, you know, part of the story that, uh, you know, Ed and Brian are, are unearthing here, this kind of reorganization. I got a question. Um, Either Brian or Ed, I assume most of this uh, research was undertaken in the past year during the pandemic. Is that correct? Um, and I was kind of curious, um, are there uh, any uh, research leads that maybe you hope to pursue once the pandemic lifts that maybe getting to Pawtucket, maybe local historical societies, Absolutely. or uh, could you, do you have any specifically that maybe you, or Brian, you just to leave? Sure. Um, well, we know that there are some newspapers from Providence, including um, some copies or some editions of the newspaper that um, that Eugene Watson was the managing editor for, uh, which was an African American uh, newspaper uh, based in Providence. So we know that copies of those papers exist on microfilm um, in the Rhode Island Historical Society. So that's definitely a, a trip that we plan to make uh, at some point. Uh, and there might be other th things to, uh, to find as well. Um, you know, we haven't really tried to look too much at, you know, school or church records, those might be available as well. But it, it, you know, it's hard to get people to respond to emails or even sometimes phone calls. So we're not really sure what leads there might be until I think once we can talk maybe in person to an archivist or something like that, we might have a better sense. But yeah, there definitely are some leads, but um, but yeah, it's going to have to wait until we can actually go physically and look at the microfilm. Brian, did you take a trip? Uh, yeah, I will say um, almost all of the Watson family are buried in a in the same cemetery in Pawtucket, and so one day during the summer, my daughter and I took a trip to. Um, to Pawtucket and wandered around the cemetery for a long time. Luckily, it was a nice day and we were outside. So, you know, the pandemic was not an issue and we, we saw only two other people, I think, because um, we were looking for the family plot. You know, they're all, like I said, they're all buried or most of them are buried in the same place or in the same cemetery, but couldn't find anything. There are some older parts of the cemetery that are, are a little overgrown and kind of run down. And so I'm not even sure if the, the the grave markers still exist. Um, so that's another area that we're trying to um, trying to pursue at some point. Great, thanks. And the YMCA records as well. Yeah, we've contacted them and they have not replied. So we, we don't know what kind of uh, records they have. Uh, an archivist at the Rhode Island Historical Society did uh, share with us a PDF, copy. The, the Pawtucket YMCA put out a, I can't remember if it was a monthly or bi-weekly newsletter uh, 
and she shared a PDF copy of one that very tantalizingly describes how uh, team pictures of the YMCA basketball squad had been taken and were available to be picked up, which it was encouraging for us in terms of, well, surely they took a picture of the football team, the soccer team. Uh, but, you know, we, we've had no success in finding an image if it, if it was made. I would also maybe add too that, um, I mean, I hadn't really ever looked too much into the history of soccer in Pawtucket or in Rhode Island for that matter. I mean, I'd heard of the Free Wanderers and some of these other teams in more in the context of Fall River. Um, and, um, and so I was a little surprised that there, I mean, unless I'm mistaken, but there doesn't seem to have been a lot of research done on Pawtucket uh, or a lot of images or other kinds of things available. And I mean, even the, the um, the, uh, the Pawtucket Public Library has a huge collection of photographs and things from Pawtucket, which they put on, on the website and on other websites. And uh, the soccer is not very well represented, especially for the period that we're talking about. I mean, even JMP Coates, I mean, that's another, that's later, obviously, yeah. but um, yeah, they even misidentify the um, a celebration ticket for the American Cup winning squad in 1910, I think it is. Um, as being a, a football team, meaning I think American right. football rather than soccer. So there doesn't seem to be at least, you know, as far as I can tell, a, a great deal of knowledge or research about that part of Pawtucket's past anyway. But I'm happy to be corrected if there's somebody that yeah. we all know <laughs> who has been doing that research, that would be great. Can I make a, another comment? Um, went to graduate school with Khalil Muhammad, uh, who is now teaching at, at Harvard. He's one of the leading uh, you know, scholars on the African-American experience, was you know, at the Schomburg in New York before you know, going back um, in, in, into you know, the academy. Um, he wrote about African-Americans in crime uh, in around this same time, comparing um, Immigrant Americans, in particular, the Italians, uh, the new immigrants at the time, and, and African Americans. And I remember him in this seminar talking about, you know, crime reports and, and how race, meaning either, you know, colored or Italian, you know, was, was always identified and, and kind of led to this, you know, kind of profiling and criminality and, and, and stereotyping. So when I heard you say, funny talk and antics. I'm wondering if this is tied into the very, you know, common practice um, at the turn of the century of minstrels, you know, minstrel acts, you know, whether yeah. it was, you know, at the local church um, or at a private, you know, place of entertainment, you know, Americans were regularly consuming um, minstrel acts uh, where people were in blackface and, um, you know, s racial songs and hearkening back to, you know, the Gone with the Wind era. So uh, ha have you th thought about making some of these connections, you know, to, to the wider production of, of racial culture? I, that, I agree. I mean, that's one of the first things that, that came to mind with the wording that was used in that description. And, and, and interestingly, some of the, you know, looking through the newspaper archives, uh, more than once I've found an article on one side of the paper that is, whether it's talking about the brothers specifically or Eugene's civil rights work, you know, very serious, uh, considered piece. And on the other side of the paper is an ad for a minstrel show coming into town that is just filled with offensive language. So, you know, these two things are happening in the same space with no apparent contradiction. And, uh, you know, as, as Brian described at first, we, we, you know, the clear racial overturns of that description are, are, are obvious. But at first we, you know, we're trying to understand it as like, you know, is, are they, is this person, Perhaps not African American, but is an you know an uh, an English you know 
colony, whatever, uh, immigrant, and, and you know, as it didn't didn't turn out to be the case. But uh, yeah, that that is a very reasonable connection to make, I think. And then the and then the evolution in the newspapers, right? From from that first description to gentlemen of color um, to a Cracker Jacks commenting on their playing style, and then you know finally uh, you know a benefit. So yeah, I, I found that trajectory to be to really be fascinating as well. It's you a know, fast the, trajectory the content, too. Yeah, the content of your character as opposed to you know the color of your skin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, if I may in, in interject on the evolution of the description uh, that Tom mentioned, I don't know how many of you remember Ben Johnson, a uh, hundred meter sprinter who won the gold for Canada in, uh, in Korea. And, uh, and he was originally from uh, the Caribbean, so, uh, Jamaica. And so the day he won the and you know that Canada is the most politically correct <laughs> language, uses the most politically correct language. But so the day he won the Olympics, uh, uh, the, the goal that he was described as Canadian Ben Johnson wins gold. Next day, there were rumors about his being, uh, having doped. And so it was Jamaican born uh, <laughs> Ben Johnson. <laughs> you know, uh, accused of doping. And then when he was established, he was described as Jamaican. <laughs> so there was this kind of, uh, which in Canada in the 1980s is quite uh, quite something, I mean, you know, comparable to that language in, at the turn of the century. If I may interject something, this is uh, this is fascinating work, and um, what it's given me is the impetus to follow up on something I stumbled on last year. Um, there was a book that Steve Holroyd actually um, put me onto um, called "Black Pioneers of the North American Soccer League," um, written by a gentleman by the name of Patrick Horn, who actually played in the league uh, back in the 1970s and uh, became a journalist afterwards. And it's a, it's a remarkable book and opens up uh, a lot of uh, really interesting stories about people who played in the NASL. And the one thing I stumbled on is that the first African-American who played in the North American Soccer League um, was a gentleman by the name of Odie Cannon, who was drafted by the Dallas Tornado here in Texas in 1972. And um, really fascinating backstory uh, about how he came out of San Francisco and um, he was a, quite an accomplished soccer player who went to play at Chico State that was a big program um, in California back in those days and uh, before he was drafted and, and actually tried out for the Olympic team. Um, but for some strange reason, and getting back to the comment you made earlier about how the, you know, the, the work that you found and the early players that were involved in this, how they did not create a gold rush, um, he was a sprinter and he ran 9-8 uh, also um, and, um, and a 9,800 yard dash. And um, for some strange reason, when he tried out for the Olympic team, they decided to make him a left back. And um, despite the fact that he had scored three goals um, in qualifying as a left back, uh, he was left off the Olympic team and it created quite a political stir in California at the time. Uh, and I grew up there in the San Francisco Bay Area and I don't remember any of this. But um, when he drafted, Dallas brought him in and they made him a left back also. And, um, and Ron Newman, according to Cannon in this interview in the book, told him that he was too fast to play soccer and that he would run out of field um, if, if they put him you know, up, in, up in, in the front part of the position, uh, which I found remarkable. But coincidentally, and, and back to the original point, um, I, the work I've been doing over the last year in the NASL in Texas, I actually have been speaking extensively with his college coach and also one of his teammates um, who still live in, in Northern California. And what this presentation has given me is the impetus that uh, I'm gonna try to reach out through them to um, Odie Cannon and really try to drag, uh, dig a little bit deeper into this, uh, this whole story, which I think is probably fascinating. And I hope that, um, you know, that the, the work of things that are being done and things like this that our predecessors um, 
or our successors 30 years from now aren't looking back and saying, gee, wouldn't it have been nice if somebody could have dragged out these photos and, and, uh, and details from, uh, from this experience. And that's what I'm going to try to do there. Looking forward to it. Didn't mean to shut down the conversation. <laughs> we still have uh, time for for questions. Uh, well, I would I would just just to kind of follow up on that. I, it is a, a you know, I guess I'm, I'm glad to hear that 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 people want to follow up on the research and and uh, get players especially, but also family members to possibly tell their stories. I know Patrick has done research on uh, you know has gotten in touch with family members. Uh, and of course, James Brown. Um, and so that's, I mean, we've been kind of disappointed that there, they apparently no one in the family, um, you know, none of the sons had any children. Um, there are some leads about possible cousins or brothers-in-laws and things like that. But at, at this moment, it seems like tracking down family members of the Watsons is going to be a challenge. So it's nice to hear that people might you know, be inspired to take on that research uh, for later periods when the players themselves and of course family members are much more available and, and hopefully willing to talk about their experiences directly. Brian and Ed, I don't know if you guys can hear me. I was, was uh, curious to know, maybe I missed that as I was switching from the computer to the phone, but I, would love to know more about the pictures that, that last slide that's still up there. Um, if you could explain a little bit more kind of where those came from, um, how, how you came across them and, and just the, the, uh, the, the research behind those photos would be, would be really interesting. Sure. Um, I mean, they're, uh, they just sort of track with what I was saying about these kind of trickles of, of evidence of, um, people of color, uh, people of African descent, I guess maybe more specifically playing uh, soccer in various locations. Uh, and so um, some of them are like, this is the Barrow School in Springfield, Massachusetts. I wrote about uh, there's three uh, boys there who played soccer for that, uh, for that team. They won the, the school boy league uh, that, that particular year. Um, uh, Tom has talked about the Kearney High School team. He mentioned that early on. Um, this is a photograph of uh, from the um, municipal, uh, the city municipal museum in New York, or is that what it's called? But um, and I think it shows. It's you can't obviously see it on the screen now, but it does seem if you if you go to their website, you can really um, it's a really high resolution photo, and you can really focus in, and it does appear to show uh, a team with um, you know players of color. Uh, on the pitch in Central Park, and that would fit. The time frame is probably 1910, 1915, something like that. And that's right at the moment when we start to see Afro-Caribbean uh, immigrants beginning to form clubs in in the city. So uh, it's possible. Uh, again, I have an essay about this particular image and uh, on the SASH site. Uh, and then the final one is a is a high school team from Chicago. Uh, one of the high schools there that was an integrated high school and had a soccer team and uh, included an African-American uh, player who I haven't been able to identify. The Ancestry.com has yearbooks digitized from that school, including like a couple of years later and maybe a couple of years earlier, but not from the year uh, that I need. So uh, I haven't been able to identify who that player is, um, but it's from Chicago. I believe that uh, player was out of Lane Tech, and I have his name and oh, okay. a, a yearbook image of it, and I'll see if I can dig that up and send it your way. And it kind of speaks to what was said earlier. He, too, was a, a, quite the accomplished track star that uh, merged over onto the soccer pitch quite easily. And I'm going to add a little something about Leonard Rainey here in that Carney photo in the, the bottom right-hand corner. So Kearney is, you know, a working class town across the river from Newark, um, the state's largest and, you know, most prominent uh, city with a sizable overtime African-American population. 
Leonard and his family lived on a block uh, right in the epicenter of this so soccer neighborhood. I, I've called it a, you know, a foundational, maybe first soccer uh, neighborhood in the United States, but he's right in the middle uh, of all these other families. So I'm assuming he was just playing with the kids and learned how to play um, and, and got to the high school. And, and I saw that image and I tried to track down uh, the family and Michelle Rainey, uh, the granddaughter, uh, went to Rutgers Newark, worked in East Orange, a nearby city, and then eventually moved across the country to retire in Las Vegas. And I had no luck through social media, even though I could find her on Facebook, she did not respond. I guess everybody doesn't use Messenger. Uh, and then I finally got an address and wrote her a letter and then she responded. And she ended up sending me digitally through email, a couple other photographs of uh, not only uh, George Rainey, but his little brother, Wellington Rainey. So there were at least two, there possibly a third brother who uh, played soccer uh, in clubs and for the high school. Uh, and I've yet to kind of reach back and, and uh, you know, get more information uh, about George. But the, yeah, this is the, the difficult work that, that Ed and Brian uh, have done to try to track down every little, you know, thread to, to you know, tell a more complete story. We are right at the hour uh, mark here and uh, no further questions or comments. Um, maybe we'll just add, ask Ed or Brian just to kind of wrap up. But uh, if uh, they don't want to do that, I want to just thank everybody for, for joining us once again. Uh, I think we were up uh, around 20 participants at one point. Uh, good healthy start to uh, 2021. Uh, and uh, as they've said, you know, there needs to be more work done uh, on this topic and the uh, SASH supports that and we will continue to support that. Uh, and, and we hope to, you know, to can continue uh, to have these types of topics uh, uh, talked about and discussed. So Brian and Ed, I'll give you a uh, last shot here if there are no further questions. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to get physically inside libraries and archives soon to see what else we can, we can learn about the Watsons. Uh, but other than that, thank you. Thanks to all of you for, for joining us and thank you for your questions. Yeah, I would just second what Ed said. Thanks everybody for being on the call and for, um, for your interesting and engaging questions. All right, we'll see you next month uh, where we'll focus on the Irish influence. We have some uh, panelists uh, from across the pond uh, that will uh, join us. A uh, pretty exciting lineup of, uh, of three folks uh, to talk about that. Uh, so uh, keep track of us on the website and social media, uh, and we'll see you in this space uh, next month. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Brian. This was wonderful. Thank you, guys.